So this is a, a feels to me a really exciting occasion. There's a, certainly a buzz around the room and the feeling that we're starting on something very special here. I don't know whether this is going to be the biggest change to the profession of teaching in England for a generation, or whether it's going to be yet another full start that, that disappoints. But I am optimistic that it'll be the former, and I certainly hope it'll be the former, and I'm committing, committed to doing whatever I can to make sure that that's the case. I think this is a really important opportunity for teachers and other people like me who are not teachers, not yet members of the Chartered College, who are um, part of that story, I hope. So I'm going to talk about what I think professionalism means. It's difficult to do this in a way that doesn't imply that teaching is not already a proper profession. And actually, maybe teaching isn't a proper profession. We talk about the teaching profession. But I think to, to really be the kind of profession that I would see as, as what we need to be, to have the status and to have the credibility and to have the impact. And my view is that teaching is far and away the most important of all those professions. Uh, yes, yes, we need accountants and we need surveyors. Yeah, thank you. We need surveyors and, and um, you know, architects and all those people. And, and we need surgeons and nurses, yes. But actually, teachers make more difference to more people's lives in a way that people, more people feel more passion about, I think. And we should hang on to that thought. What we do really, really matters. I'm going to talk about three things here. Professional evidence, which I hope builds on what John said, and the idea of, of evidence-based practice and research, and how do we integrate that into what happens in classrooms. Professional development, how do teachers learn to be better teachers? And then a little bit about values, the, probably mostly on that first one. Professional evidence. So, one of the aspects I think that's important to being a professional is reading. It's about study. It's about thinking about what you do. It's about having a theory, actually. I know that's sometimes a dirty word. But I think that's important. I think it's important that we um, not over-intellectualize, but that we do have um, something more than just what you see. And I, I wrote this blog back in uh, June or July in the summer because I quite often give talks and, and mention a book that I think is really interesting. And I'll say, has anyone read the book? And, and nobody has. And then I'll say, has anyone read any books? And sometimes one or two hands go up. So don't disappoint me. Who, who's read a, a book about education this year, i.e. since September? Go on. OK, this is a, not a typical audience of teachers <laughs> then, is it? Who, who's read more than five books about education since September? Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> OK, so you're unusual. You're very un in fact, you've, so you've probably read all this stuff, haven't you? Uh, all right, moving on. <laughs> this is my starter pack, which if you thought that you could stomach about 50 pages worth of reading and you just wanted to get going, these are the four things that I would say. Somewhat immodestly, I've included two things that I was involved in creating. And, and other people might choose different things, and that's fine. What I think is interesting, though, is that all of those are relatively recent. They're all, I think the earliest one is the, the Rosenshine Principles of Instruction there in 2012. And this is quite a new phenomenon, the idea of writing things that are, have a sort of research pedigree, a research credibility, but in a way that's accessible for professionals. It, it, it didn't used to happen, and now, there's all that stuff that I referred to. Most of that is quite recent. These things are quite recent. There seems to be a, a massive growth of, of this kind of engagement type writing. I think it's a very exciting time. So if you are one of those people who's read all this, I was just going to say, well, here's two that you might not have read, but you probably read those two anyway. They, these have come out since my list in June, and I think they're both very good. So you know, if you were struggling to find something, uh, I would recommend both those books. Now, I was thinking about what do we mean by evidence-based, and over the weekend, my Twitter timeline filled up with this particular tweet, which was somebody, 
allegedly had seen this in a classroom somewhere, we don't know where, and then there was a bit of discussion about, and it said, I don't know if you can read it actually, it says, these are the seven evidence-based components of a good or outstanding lesson. And there's lots of um, you know, non-negotiable shoulds and, and musts in this, which some, a few people objected to. But quite a few people were saying, actually, none of this really is evidence-based. Uh, and I think, broadly speaking, I would agree with those people. It's interesting because evidence-based here, I think, is being used just as a, as a synonym for I like this. It, it doesn't really mean there's any evidence. And I think we need to be a little careful about that as evidence-based starts to be associated. Well, who'd be against evidence-based? You know, come on, is anybody in favor of evidence-averse practice? Or <laughs> that, that doesn't quite ring so well, does it? So it, it's, it's one of those good things. It's motherhood and apple pie. But evidence-based, the, the trick, um, the test there is, well, show me the evidence. What is it? Let's see it. Let's have a look. I think you struggle to find evidence to support a lot of these claims. Usually, there's a germ of, of something that, that is true hidden, hidden in some of these kinds of statements. And I think that may be the case in some of these. But I don't think that if you just take them at face value, they are actually evidence-based. But I think that's the kind of discussion that we ought to be having as a profession. We ought to be having an informed discussion about, well, what, is, what, what do these statements mean? And what sorts of evidence is there to support them? And should we be using words like must and should around statements like that? To what extent can you mandate people to be better than they are? And I think my answer would be probably not much, actually. Getting better is a bit more complicated than that. So I thought I'd share this definition. This is from evidence-based medicine. People often look at medicine, and um, John mentioned Ben Goldacre before, and uh, you know, there's, there's a lot to learn from evidence-based medicine. But actually, evidence-based medicine is pretty new as well. This was a famous uh, paper in the British Medical Journal in 1996, and that was the time when evidence-based medicine was really just getting established. The Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford, I think, was 92 or 93. David Sackett was the um, first director of that. And this was a statement about what it is and what it isn't. And it's one of those definitions that you have to really sweat over every single word because each word is chosen carefully and carries a quite a heavy burden of meaning. So things like conscientious, explicit, judicious. I probably haven't got time to unpick all of it, but judicious means you still have to apply judgment, okay? This is not a recipe. It's not telling you what to do. It's information that informs a judgment that you make as a professional. And evidence informs decision-making. It doesn't tell you what to do. It helps you to make certain kinds of decisions. So it's not, evidence isn't the solution to all our problems. It won't make you a fabulous teacher if you're a rubbish teacher. But having evidence and having a discussion that includes evidence, I think, raises the level of our capacity to improve. This is the, uh, the toolkit summary, which again, John was talking about, and the feedback and metacognitive. I, I partly just put this in because I, ever since um, the toolkit first came out, and again, this is something that I had a very small part in, or in the design of originally, I guess, but from then on, it's really Steve Higgins who's made this work. Um, and uh, I, I created this slide, and I, it's almost a, a point of principle to, to crowbar it into every talk I've given since, so there it is. But the, the point I wanted to make is that memorizing where those different interventions lie on the graph. So the graph shows how much difference does it make on the vertical axis and how much does it cost to do. So top left means it's a big impact for not much money. Bottom right means a much smaller impact and or very expensive to do. And sometimes, if this isn't familiar, there's some really challenging stuff there, and it's, it's a good basis for a conversation. But the, the valuable thing isn't to know, oh, yes, feedback, that's up the top there, and you know, smaller classes don't make a massive difference, and they're very expensive. That's the sort of headline, tick list level of knowledge. It's much more internalized, where, where it becomes valuable when it's much more internalized. So if a colleague says to you, OK, so feedback looks like that's something that's worth looking at. 
What does that actually mean? What, what would that be doing? We're thinking about doing, you know, in, introducing triple marking of every piece of work that every student does, because that's feedback, isn't it? And then you've got, to, as a sophisticated consumer of evidence and an evidence-based practitioner, you'd be able to say, well, actually, no, that isn't quite what the research says. There's kind of elements of feedback in that, but that may not be, and so on. And that's the kind of discussion that I think an evidence-informed practitioner would be able to have. And, and there certainly are many teachers in this country who can have that kind of conversation. And it certainly is the case that England is leading the world in this area. The, the idea of the research schools, the impact of the Education Endowment Foundation, uh, research ed, I think, is another big part of that, if people are involved in that, and if you're not, then you certainly should be. Those things are, all of these things started in England, and they're being copied around the world. And yes, there's interesting practice in Shanghai, I'm sure there is, but I, I think some of the best schools in the world are within walking distance of where we stand now, so we don't really need to go to Shanghai, actually. We can just talk to each other. Uh, Alison mentioned this, yeah, so grading lessons. How hard is it to really make a judgment, uh, assuming that's something you want to do? Is that something we should be wanting to do? This is really complex, and um, yeah, three years ago now, this, uh, we had a meeting um, organized by Teach First and the Teacher Development Trust, and I gave a talk there, and I'd previously said a few things about this, I guess, which was why I was invited. And it's changed. This is, for me, there's a whole list of things where evidence has made a difference to policy. And this is one. Within months of that discussion getting out there, Ofsted had changed their official policy about how they grade. And not everything in Ofsted was, was marvellous at that point, but they, you know, there's an example of a, a specific change that was a reaction to evidence and a good reaction. And actually, I think quite a lot of those were stacking up. And uh, I do think it's unfortunate that now we seem to be going on this grammar school route because that's a, a pretty strong, clear example of something that is not evidence-based. In fact, goes against the evidence. And it's a shame that that rather sort of blots the record. <clears throat> but maybe, that won't, it, maybe it won't come to pass. Who knows? Let's be careful when we're thinking about evidence and if, when we're talking about what works because we can have some quite evangelical and quite uh, simplistic views of this. So I think it's important to remember that what works doesn't always work. In fact, quite often it doesn't work. And that's one of the challenges, actually, that the EEF is finding now. They've funded all these projects according to the best evidence. Not all of them have had positive impact. And I think that's to be expected and actually a really good thing. But in terms of managing that message, I think some people think that's quite challenging. So a, a really important part of evidence-based practice for me isn't just knowing what does the research say, OK, yeah, we're doing that. We're doing feedback. We're doing metacognitive. We're, we're doing peer tutoring. You know, yep, tick all those off. Actually, it's building this stuff in, which is the evaluation. You know, has it worked for us this time? in the way that we did it, and what is, what is working well and what isn't. And this is also really, really hard. This, this is not a trivial thing that you're going to uh, read off one slide and be an expert in. OK, so that was my first. Now, second, then, professional development. The words professional and development kind of naturally go together, but I don't think this is actually very natural for us yet, but I think there's plenty of opportunity to make this fa really fabulous. How can you tell? if a teacher requires improvement, or a school. I think there's a very simple test, actually. One simple question you can ask. Do they teach actual children? Because if they do, then they need to be better. They need to be better next year than they were this year, and better this year than they were last year. And you might be the best teacher in the world. Anybody? At the back, yes, thank you. You still need to be better. Or you might be, you know, dreadfully inadequate. You still need to be better. It's the same. There's, there's no excuse for not improving. If you're a professional, that's my view. Uh, so here we are, the standards, evidence-based. You know, that is, it really is. And uh, there's a few people in the room here who are part of helping to put that together, and I think we're all pretty proud of it. 
What do we know about how teachers learn? And this is really interesting to me because if you're a teacher, then you actually know a fair bit about learning, don't you? Because that's your day job, trying to make small people do it. And mostly what we know about learning of, of older people is that it's pretty much the same. So all that knowledge we have about how you get young people to learn, you can apply to yourself about how you get, well, still young, but maybe not quite as young people to learn other kinds of stuff. Some of it's a little bit different, and that's important, but mostly it's the same. So this is my list of things that, again, from the evidence, is pretty much, not, maybe not all learning and teaching, but broadly speaking, a lot of the things that we mainly try and get kids to learn in school, we have these kinds of uh, requirements. And I'm not going to go through that because I'm running out of time a bit, but um, I think they are, they, they, well, for this audience, I'm sure they're part of the sort of normal assumption we know these things. These make it more difficult. So learning aims for teachers must be strongly linked to learning gains for pupils. We've got to have that thread connecting what you're learning to do with what impact that's going to have on students. Uh, and the, the other one I draw attention there is the, the fourth one there, changing habits. It's much, much harder to unlearn something that you're already doing than it is to learn from scratch. And mostly, teachers learning stuff is about unlearning, actually. You've got to learn new habits. So let's recognize that. That's part of the challenge. And we don't learn habits by going to a training day and hearing someone talk about them. We learn habits by doing them, being made to do them, getting that feedback and so on. So it's the same kind of thing in the way that you learn. You know, if you've ever ha had a change of your violin teacher or your golf coach or any of those things and they say, no, not like that, you've got to learn to do it like this. That's the kind of thing you've got to do in your professional lives, I'm afraid. And the third aspect of this learning is about leadership and culture. And um, again, the one I'm just going to draw attention there is that middle one about trust. And I'm going to say a little bit about trust because I think this is so important. And trust isn't just a, uh, a sort of woolly thing about, you know, if you loved us, you'd, you'd just leave us to get on with stuff. Trust is a really important part of making accountability work. So this is not saying let's not have accountability. We're a, we're a profession. We need accountability. But we need accountability in a framework where there is trust. So let me say what I think that means. But before I do that, I'm just going to give you a, a quick sort of recipe for what I think um, requiring improvement means. And, and here's a sort of set of steps that uh, I think might do this. Uh, my advice, this, not all of this is strictly evidence-based, I think it would be fair to say, but I think it's in line with the best evidence. So pick one thing. Work on one thing. Don't, think, don't work on every aspect of your practice. And pick an evidence-based thing. So the example I've given there is from one of those documents I cited, the Rose and Shine, 10 Principles, and this is number one. Begin a lesson with a short review of previous learning. There's evidence to support that, so it's worth learning to do. It's not easy. How good at it are you? That's where the observation comes in. But don't just get anyone to observe. You get someone who's really good at doing this. And maybe you observe them as well as part of that. Maybe you capture some video so you can uh, have that excruciating experience of watching yourself. Make sure you've got the right support. So expertise, people who are good at this thing. You need the leadership support, the time to do it. You need a coaching relationship because these things are hard. When you've tried five times and you still haven't got it, you need somebody to keep you going on it, just like with the golf swing or the violin or whatever. And then deliberate practice, and that's why I've referenced this uh, uh, second document there from the Deans for Impact. This is relatively new. I think December that came out. And it's about, it, it specifically relates to um, initial teacher education, but it's absolutely applicable, I think, to continuing. And it's about this idea of deliberate practice, draws heavily on um, Ericsson's work there. And then, of course, you need to keep reassessing that to see if you've made progress and to track the progress that you've made. And that's, again, where your expert um, critical friend comes in. So uh, I'm just going to say a little bit about trust and then broader stuff about the values. Uh, because I mentioned trust earlier, and discussion about trust, I think, is often a bit woolly. And actually, there's some, some good definitions of trust. This is one I really like from literature on looking at trust in schools. 
Trust is the willingness to be vulnerable to another party. So you choose to put the knife into somebody else's hand with the blade pointing towards you. You're not forced to do it because it's an accountability pressure. You choose to do it. And you say to that person, do what you will with this, because you know that you can trust them. And these are the components, these five things there, that have to be in place for trust. And then we also know that there is good evidence to show that this is a, a crucial component of school improvement. So schools, uh, in this study anyway, had virtually no chance of improving without having this as part of their climate. And interestingly, the most important aspect of trust they found in this study and other studies isn't about um, trusting teachers, it's about the trust that teachers had for parents and pupils. So it was the teachers making themselves vulnerable to the members of their community. And if you've ever heard Alison talk about Roxham, you'll know that that's exactly what they did there. I think that's a really interesting model for us. The test for trust is, which lesson do you want somebody to come and watch? Do you want them to watch your worst lesson, where everything goes wrong, so that they can help you the most? Or do you want them to watch your best lesson, so that you can tick the box and, and show that you're okay? And if you choose the first, then that's an indicator you've got trust, I think. Now, this is my set of values for professionalism. I think values are really important. And some of these, I think, will be uncontroversial. Obviously, a strong moral purpose. That's why we're here. We don't, we're not doing it for the money, mostly. <clears throat> we're doing it because we think it's important. We can see the impact it has on young people's lives. Let's also value specialist expertise. That being a teacher isn't a, a kind of general thing that anyone can do with a bit of common sense and learning on the job. There is a whole host of specialist areas of expertise that not, every, not any single individual can have all of these. So we need specialism. Just as if you're a surgeon or an, I, I don't know, any other profession, I'm sure, you specialize. Well, shouldn't that be the same for us? Yes, it should. Some of this is about a confidence to seek criticism. Sometimes it seems that teachers can be a bit precious about anybody implying that they're not fabulous. Well, let's be a bit more mature, I think. Let's be open to that critique. Let's show that we're a profession and we can handle that. Evidence, I've talked about that. Evaluation, I've talked about that. Again, let's be willing to evaluate what we do and learn from it, find out whether it's good or not. It may not be. It's unlikely to be as good as it could be. I've said already, every teacher, better every year. Let's make that a value that we sign up to. It doesn't matter how good you are or how bad you're going to be better next year. And that it also doesn't matter if you have been teaching for 29 years. You can still be better in year 30. Let's also get beyond the sort of tribalism of fighting battles over which particular group we belong, you know, are we traditional, progressive, or any of that nonsense. Let's look for inclusive solutions that, where we find common ground. That surely is what a, a mature profession would do. And that let's have a collective voice about those issues that matter in the policy space so that we can make a difference to what policymakers think. And, and actually, teachers and, and advocacy groups can be really influential if they just get a message really strong. So I think that's a really important part of what a, um, a professional organization, a chartered college, can do. So I just want to finish with this because I love it. I said teaching is the most important job in the world. It's also probably the hardest job in the world. So we should be proud about that. The most demanding, subtle, nuanced and frightening activity that our species has ever invented. That's a description of being in a classroom. So it is hard and that's a challenge. But teachers who are not up for challenge tend not to last very long. So the fact that you're all here means you're up for a challenge. And we should take this on, I think, and, and show that the hardest job in the world and the most important one is one that is backed by a proper view about what professionalism requires and entails. Thank you.